The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Add another swerve and then. Hello, Brandon. Man, that's Anne. And that's Anne. And she'll talk. And you caught me every weekend only on the weekend feature. This is Vince Russo. Welcome to the brand. It is uh, December 9th. Uh, I don't know when we're playing this, though. I don't even know why I'm giving you the date. I'm a moron to be giving you the date because I'm putting this interview in the can. I have no idea um, why I'm giving you the date. But anyway, listen, I'm not even going to do my commercial right now because we only have a limited a time with my next guest. Uh this is somebody, you know, probably, not probably, I mean, without a doubt, hands down, my closest friend ever in the wrestling business. Him and I have been up and down the byway and the highway, and it's really a testament to friendship because here we are some, I met I, I met Ed in 1990, Ed, when, hold on, see, now I got to open up his mic, Ed, because I'm an and Ed, when 98, I, 98. I, me and Ed met in 1998. Uh, we're still friends to this day, so I guess we're going on what's going to be 18 years in 2017. Yeah, we're in, in well in 2018 it'll be 20 years. We'll have our we'll have our big anniversary. We'll have a big anniversary. Now I got to ask you a question, bro. When when you first come on here with Google, why do you got to always ask me what are we talking about? What are we talking about? What are we talking about? How how many conversations have you and I had over the phone, off the air? Why do I got to tell you about what we're talking about here? Well, because I want to go over the format and I want to make sure that it fits my liking and that I approve of everything on the format. I understand that some of your other guests do that. So I figured I would oh, do that God. too. <laughs> Bro, you know, you know what? I want to talk to the great Ed Ferrara today because, uh, yeah, I want to talk about the inner workings of NXT because uh, I know you're down there at Full <laughs> Sail, you, Terry, mm -hmm. and the gang. Oh, yeah. How's that going? Triple H, how's everything going down there? Oh, it's it's a big love fest. It's it's going wonderful. I, I'm, I, I'm the happiest I've ever been in the wrestling business. <laughs> uh, I didn't know it could be so good. I didn't know it could be so good. No, I... <laughs> and you're going to love this conversation we've had because, bro, like, I've really been thinking, like, I swear to God, I'm like, all right, it's coming on the show. I love talking to Ed. We could talk, me and Ed could talk like two buddies. But what are me and Ed really really going to talk about and bro quite honestly i'm sick and tired of belly aching over the same things mm -hmm. I, I you know ed bro let, let me before i get into the main topic okay i, I want i want to just talk about this briefly uh because i want to get inside your headset a little bit because maybe i need to i i need to train my mind and start looking at things a little differently ed i'm not a wrestling fan today I, mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I, I, I made the decision, this, bro, I left money on the table because I was doing shows that they were paying me to watch Raw and watch pay-per-views, uh, and then they were paying me. Bro, I could not stand watching the product anymore to the point that I left those shows because I was like, listen, man, I need the cash. I really need the money, but I can't, I can't sit there three hours on Monday night. I can't sit through SmackDown. So, and here, here's what was happening to me. I'll be honest with you. I'm sitting through the show 
And I hate, I, I'm, I'm actually, I, I hate watching the show. I, I'm sitting there. I feel it's a massive waste of my time. So I'm going through that. Then, Ed, when the show's over, I then have to talk about the show for another hour when there's nothing to talk about, bro. I then here's the, here was the third leg of it, Ed. I would be honest with my critiques. And then, bro, here come the freaking tweets all week long that I had to deal with. Yep. So, I, I, yeah, I made the decision, Ed, you know what? I'm done with it. I'm not watching anymore. I'm leaving the money on the table. I'm not going to comment. on. I don't give a shit. I, I mean, I really, really don't. And I'll, believe, I'll be honest with you, Ed. It's hurt my brand a little bit because that's what everybody expects from Vince Russo. But as far as peace <clears throat> of mind, bro, I have a much, much greater pre peace of mind than I did before. Well, we've talked about that before, kid. We've talked about how... You know, we get to this point in our lives and it's more important to do what you need to do to be a happier, more fulfilled person than it is to, you know, scrabble after the dollar. As long as you can keep the roof over your head and put the food on your table, you know, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm 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 teaching, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. Am I making rock star money? No way, no way. I'm a teacher. I mean, that that's 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 you know, almost poverty wages to begin with. But I get some fulfillment from what I do. And also I can enjoy my life outside and I don't have those headaches. So I, I don't know how you did it as long as you did uh, watching raw all three hours. And then for a while there, weren't you watching SmackDown too? Oh, yeah, when it came, bro. Oh my five God. Hours, well, five hours. Let me tell you something. I, I stopped watching too. But not for the same reasons as you, because I know that you were having a lot of problems with the, the the style of the work and all that. And we went we went over that last time I was on the show. That didn't bother me as much, but it just got to the point where, and this is where this is what I saw coming a long time ago, that they have now put so much product out there that it's impossible to stay on top of it. And when you are into the product, you know, you want to be watching when the big things happen. And if something happens on SmackDown, you're like, oh, I should have been watching that. Well, I guess I'm going to have to watch SmackDown now. And pretty soon, you know, you've got how many, you've got your hours are in the double digits every week if you want to watch all the product. And I wasn't even doing that. When they did the brand split this past summer, I just said, well, uh, I'll just keep with Raw because I was watching Raw on Hulu. And even then, it was only an hour and a half. It was the cut down version of it. But I got to the point where uh, just a few months ago, um, I stopped watching like in the beginning of end of October around then. And I just I just stopped giving a shit. And it just got to the point where there was so much. And I just and, and I wasn't being blown away by any of the stories or angles they were doing anyway. And I just was like, you know, why am I bothering with this? Why am I giving this you know, time out of my week? to watch this thing that I'm not even enjoying. I, I realized that, you know, for the past few months, last, last few months while I was watching, I wasn't even watching. I was doing other things while it was on. I was, I was scrolling through my Twitter feed. I was doing something going in and out of the room. And I just didn't care. And I haven't watched the, 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 uh, the product in months. Um, I thought I would stay up on NXT, and I still watched a couple of episodes of that, but I still haven't. I haven't watched hey, it in months. Hey, Ed, is there something to what you're? I want. I want to. I, I don't want to go off track because I want to talk about our big thing. But I got to ask you about okay. this because um, this is interesting. What you're saying, and I remember, you know, Will was born in 1987. Okay, mm -hmm. and I remember one of the things I was going to do for Will in 1987 was I was going to collect the Topps baseball card set. And I was going to get it for him every year. And as he got older, I was going to hand it over to him. Bro, baseball cards right around like 86 may have reached their peak. Mm -hmm. Bro, here's what happened. All of a sudden, baseball cards hit their peak. Bro, everybody and their mother are coming out with baseball cards yep. and, 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 and tops and Dunvers and upper deck and, and, and you, know, you know, the whole nine yards. Bowman. It got to the point like – the market was so oversaturated, like you were like, screw it. Like, you yeah. didn't even like, so, but, but bro, walk me through that. How can, how can the WWE 
oversaturate the market. I mean, as a guy that's in TV, you were in TV before the WWE. Mm-hmm. How, how can a company like the WWE oversaturate the market? What happens to the, the, the consumer or the customer or the viewer where it's, you know what, this is just too much. I'm not going to watch any of it anymore. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. And, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, a creative type. I'm not a business guy. So maybe it makes sense on their end from a business model because now they seem to be shifting away from television and focusing entirely on their network. So if that's the case, then I, I, I really can't speak to it. But from a consumer point of view, from a consumer point of view, first of all, the thing that I've always said about wrestling is, uh, again, wrestling is for wrestling fans. It's a chance to uh, every time you're watching, it's a chance to be a part of history, okay? Something huge happens. Like for me, what got me into it, I told the story a million times, Larry and Bruno. When Larry hit Bruno with the chair, I was watching that night, and I probably felt, well, maybe not entirely, but for, for, for my 13-year-old perspective, I probably felt the same way some people felt when they were watching TV and Jack Ruby assassinated Lee Harvey Oswald. You saw this thing that was momentous and huge. And at that point, I never wanted to turn off wrestling again for fear of missing something equally as huge. So that's what gets us into it. The, 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 the promise of being there for history, when it happens. I was watching that. I saw that happen live. You know, that, that's something that fans, I'm sure, tell their kids and stuff like that. But when you have so much product out there, when you have such a glutted market, such an oversaturated market, then it's kind of like when you're doing, when you're doing, uh, when you're booking shows and every match has chair shots in it. Pretty soon the chair shot doesn't mean anything. Well, the same thing here. When you got that much product, nothing really stands out because it's all more of the same noise. So to me, that's that's why I just got to the point where I just finally said to myself, why am I bothering? Yeah. And then also you look at the way that they'd been booking the product for the past however many years, um, and and they've been training the audience to not care. They'll set up an angle, they'll start going somewhere, and then they'll bail on it, or they'll change it, or they'll pull out the rug at the last minute, or decide to not go there, or somebody will get hurt. And all that does is that tra- that teaches the audience not not to get too invested because the chances of them following through on this in a satisfying way are aren't very likely. Yeah. So that to me is is why I think that they're risking losing. Uh, uh, viewers, or at least a certain segment of the viewers, yeah, yeah. you know, because I have been for the past few years nothing but a fan, aside from the work I do with NXT. NXT. Uh, uh, <laughs> but you know, they lost me. I I now no longer care and no longer feel like I'm missing anything Bro, you, momentous. You know, it's so funny. I swear to God, I gotta sit back here and I chuckle when when you see all this stuff like every week and like got guys are hurting themselves. Somebody's gonna wind up in a wheelchair. Then they're gonna reexamine the way everybody's working. But uh-huh. it's like it's exactly what you said. It nothing means anything. And then I gotta kind of chuckle because here you are talking about one chair shot. And, you know, my, my memory, bro, my freaking traumatizing <laughs> memory was Spiro Serion ripping the feathers off of Chief J. Strong Strongbow's head and dress. shoving it down his throat in the yep. corner. I remember Chief in the corner. But it's right. an unbelievable, bro. One simple freaking thing stays with you your entire life. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that is the moment that made me a fan. Yeah, and 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 I'm sure that every fan out there has that moment that 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 galvanized them as a fan. But when you've got nothing but those moments, nothing stands out, and it's all just a sea of noise. So, and and I don't feel like I'm missing anything. Yeah. All right, bro. You're gonna love this topic. All right. Of discussion. You and I have never really had this topic topic of discussion. And then I tell you this all the time. Uh, you, you, I, I, you, you're the smartest person I know. And I really, I want you to dive into this. I want you to pick it apart because I think people will be interested in this. And I don't think many people talk about this because many people don't have the insight to talk about this. You and I do, and we've never had this discussion. You got me a little scared. Here we go. 
You ready, bro? Okay. We, we're going to concentrate on one thing, okay? Bro, to this day, I sit here 55 years old, and I ask myself this question. Who the F is Vince McMahon? Huh. <laughs> who, like, seriously, like, bro, who is Vince McMahon? Wow. Because, bro, I've spent so many of my years – trying to get in the head of Vince McMahon, trying to figure him out why he does the things he does, why he's the way he is, really trying to get an understanding. And I always come up empty. You and I, over a couple of years, like literally were attached to his hip. Yes. We saw him up close and personal like ed let's face it if it's anybody else like i'm around ed ferrara when when ed ferrara and i first met i'm around ed for maybe three months i know who ed is i know what makes Ed tick i know what pisses ed off i know who ed is you you have these conversations you know you know the you know sometimes they get intimate their friendship you're not working you you know who somebody is I started working for Vince McMahon, bro, 1994. I don't know who the F the guy is. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to start with you, Wade, because I want to get in your head, and I want to really pick this thing apart. A lot of people are not in our shoes. They can't do this. I want to go back, bro, to when Bonnie um, um, Hammer, you know, and you had the discussion about possibly – writing for the wwe i never asked you this before okay did bonnie ever give you when you were at the very beginning did bonnie ever give you any insights into vince mcmahon like ed you need to know a b and c about him did 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 you have any personal insights whatsoever going in absolutely none whatsoever the way it worked out was i had just told her just in a side, like, hey, eh, joking. Hey, if you ever talk to Vince and he's looking for some, you know, some more creative minds to, to work with him, just throw my name out there. She was like, okay. And I didn't think anything of it. And then the next thing I heard from her was, he wants to meet you. So I got no heads up, no nothing. So I went in there flying blind. What I knew about him was just what I knew about him from having been a lifelong fan. Um, and that was it. Okay, Ed, the, was the first meeting at that TV? Yes. Okay. The wait, let me just make sure. No, yeah, the first time I met him was the, uh, the, 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 the morning of the King of the Ring, the King of the Ring 98, okay. um, because I flew in the night before and stayed over, so I was there for the production meeting in the morning. Ed, I got to say this. Let me tell my story, then I want to go to you, because, again, okay. I want to give people insights. Like, yeah, I want to get – Ed, I first met Vince in, like, bro, like 1991, okay? And this is when, bro, that steroid trial <laughs> right. broke out. And, uh, you know, and everybody, you know, bro, it was the same guys, the Meltzes and all those people were on the, you know, put Vince McMahon in jail, in jail bandwagon. I was the guy coming from the outside. Say, wait a minute, bro. Yeah, we don't know if this guy's guilty, not guilty, what he's done, blah, blah, blah. So I took it upon myself to get involved. With that being said, bro, I went to a stereo symposium that the WWE gave in New York City. And, uh, you know, I, I was there, whatever, um, and it hadn't started yet, and I was with the PR guy. I can't even remember his name. But anyway, Vince walks in the room. Ed, I have to tell you, and this is an absolute shoot. You know, Ed, in our business, we've worked with a lot of celebrities. Bro, I, I shared a room alone with Pamela Anderson. It was just me and Pamela Anderson in this freaking room. What? So, yeah, we've met some people with some yeah. influence, okay, bro? I got to tell you, man, bro, my my back was to the entrance of Vince McMahon walking in. I did not see him walk in the room. But, Ed, I got to tell you something. All of a sudden, I felt the change in that room, and I've never experienced that 
before or after where when they say somebody walks in a room you know it he mm -hmm. walked in the room i knew it bro i knew i didn't see it coming in i don't know what it was and then bro i turn around and i see him and bro he just had this freaking air about him and bro it wasn't a mark out moment i wasn't a vince mcmahon it's not like freaking if rihanna walked in the room it was you know it wasn't that it was he had this presence around them and 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 it was like a it, it, it was it was power you felt power bro maybe it's like how you feel if donald Trump. It, but it was power hmm. that's what it was okay so now let's go back to your first meeting what's ed ferrara's very first impression of that first one-on-one -on -one encounter with vince mcmahon you know I have to be completely honest with you, and I don't know if it's uh, hard living or what, but I really don't remember the first moment I met him or the first time. I'm thinking it was just before that production meeting, probably a handshake and a hello, but it's also because of the fact that, um, because I had been in Los Angeles, I'd been working in television, working with a lot of actors, working with actors with names and things like that, and I had gotten to the point where you know, I, I, I was, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, I had been trained to no sell, you know, when you meet somebody famous, you kind of no sell it. And you basically you you meet them one on one as one man to another man. So I didn't allow myself to feel that way. Um, I don't remember, though. I, I, I really don't. Okay, and let me ask you this, after spending some time, like, uh -huh. <laughs> what what was the first impression like what what was the first thing about this guy after spending time with him the very first impression or idea you got about vince the man that i had never met anybody like him in my entire life um i had met famous people i had met people that had some fame and celebrity and things like that i had worked with them i had never met anybody uh uh like him i'd never met anybody with like you said with a presence like him but then it also it was so he was so kind of jekyll and hyde you know like when the three of us would be working together and i don't mean jekyll and hyde i just mean like split personality like when the three of us would be working together he would be one of the boys and he would be and he would you know it would be the three of us working together as opposed to the two of us you know like looking to him and him telling us what we were going to do you know it was a, it was a simpatico and there was a there was a, a a repartee between the three of us and we got along we joked around and we made each other laugh and we had a good time but then when we would be out in front of other people especially people who he deemed below him beneath him he got this aura about him this air that kind of designed to in my opinion separate him from those people and to let them know that he was up here and they were not hey Ed, let me ask you this i bring this up all the time i'm with you 100 percent. and bro i always notice that the here's the time i always notice that bro like you know, Vince was on the fourth floor. I was on the second floor. Uh -huh. um, and I'm just talking about, like, I have memories of, like, before you even, you know, came aboard, you know? Mm -hmm. and bro, The dark I, days. The dark days. The dark days. And I, here's what I always remember about that, bro. Like, I would go up to Vince's floor, fourth floor. It would just be the two of us behind closed doors. So we're having that kind of a relationship. We go to the freaking elevator. We get in the elevator together. All of a sudden, I see this. Yep. And, bro, when people got on that elevator, they feared him, and I knew he loved it. Yes. I knew. Here's my question, though, Ed. Here's my question now, in your opinion, because we don't know. We'll never know, bro. Uh, bro, the, the greatest freaking psychiatrist in the world could not psychoanalyze this man. Let me ask you a question. Now, Ed, I think there are two reasons to why he had the, you know, one of the boys persona when it was the three of us. And all of a sudden we've got the, you know, the Vince McMahon, you know, like you said, Jekyll and Hyde, you know, whatever. It's one of two things to me. It's either a for business purposes. And he wants everybody to know I am the boss. I am up here. You are down here. You answered me. I am 100% in charge and control. So it's either the business aspect or ego. Ego. 
he he he's he he gets off on people fearing him. What do you think it is? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we. I mean, you want to talk about ego? What about the painting? The painting in his living room, <laughs> the fifteen foot high portrait of him that belonged on the cover of some fantasy novel, with him riding a friggin' unicorn. You know, I mean, it was just the most unbelievable thing. You don't have something like that as kind of like a a tongue in cheek sort of thing. You have that when you want to celebrate yourself. So yes, he had this huge ego, and at the time, bigger than any wrestler, bigger than any wrestler, bro. Oh my God! Unbelievable, bigger than anybody I had ever met. Okay, before or since, I would okay. say. Right. Um, but then you know what I was thinking about is, and I was just thinking about this when you were bringing up: is it the ego? Is it is it? Does it get off on it? I think both. I think the ego is you know, it is ego, and he does get off on it, and that feeds his ego. Uh, um, but it's also a matter of think about this. Which one is the real guy? Mm, is 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 he being was you know at the time? You know what's funny about that, Ed, and keep yeah. that thought. And I always interject like this because, like, I'm 55, and if I don't interject, I'm gonna forget. That's so right. Like, I'm 50, okay. so I might forget too. Yeah, so I don't mean we'll, to we'll be just... rude. It's not rude. So you got to remember where you are because if I don't get this, then I'm gonna forget. Mm -hmm. it. But okay. Ed, it's like, bro, listen, you'll appreciate this. Okay, I worked with Eric Bischoff in front of people and i worked with eric bischoff in small meetings mm -hmm. eric bischoff was an arrogant prick whether he was in front of a lot of people or you were in a in a in a creative meeting it doesn't uh -huh. matter bro if there were two people three people or 50 people he was an arrogant prick that treated people that way in my opinion vince was not there were two sides to oh. Vince. Clearly. Yeah. So go back to who is this guy? Go ahead. Okay. Right. That's where I was going. So I, I, I asking myself who he really was, because that's all we can talk about is who he was. I don't know who he is now. Haven't, haven't spoken to the guy in almost 20 years. So uh, who was he? At the time, my thought was, well, we're getting to see the real Vince. We're getting to see him with his hair down. We're getting to see him relaxed. We're getting to see him, you know, basically as he as he is behind closed doors because but, that's but literally they, where they, we were. Let me interrupt again because I want to paint the picture for people. What, what Ed is saying is, you know, li literal. We saw him in sweatpants. We yeah. saw him with the hair not perfect. We saw him. We heard fart. him fart. We heard him fart <laughs> in the living room. Okay, so yes, we. when Ed's talking about that side we saw, that's the side we saw. So go ahead, Ed. The, I mean, another – I'll just – put an image out there do you remember you might not remember this but i will never forget this moment we were trying to figure out the finish for one of the pay-per-views it was like a i think it was fully loaded it was the one where it was the the three-way between austin kane and undertaker and we were trying to figure out a way for there to be a double pin on the same guy and have the two wrestlers and i think it was let's just say it was uh, austin and undertaker pinning kane i don't remember exactly what the finish was but we came up with the idea of they were do they rolled the guy up and they were back to back and one had the guy's leg and the other one had the other guy's leg and they were back to back not realizing that the other guy was pinning him and that was how the and the three of us were doing it on his floor in his dining room, trying to see if it would work. Right. So it was, I, I forget who was in the pinning position, but I can tell you it wasn't Vince. Because uh, Vince, <laughs> Vince doesn't lay down for anybody. But that, so like doing things like that, the three of us, <laughs> the three of us working out a spot in his living room, yeah. okay? So you've got that. And then at the time, I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is who he really is. This is this is who he is behind closed doors. And yes, when he's around, you know, the, the little people, he's going to put on his air and he's going to do that. But now think about it. Maybe it was the other way around. Maybe we were being worked. Maybe that wasn't necessarily who he was, but he saw in you and I, he was like, these guys are making me money. These guys are helping my product get to places I didn't think it would ever get to. And uh, I need to 
I need to keep these guys happy. I need to keep these guys engaged. And I think he realized that if he tried the I'm better than you, that wouldn't work for us because we were being creative as opposed to not just a matter of working hard and pulling more cables and, and, and editing more hours of, of footage. It was about what we were doing was we needed to feel good about what we were doing in order to do our best work. So he was like, this is working. I want to keep these guys happy. Maybe that was it. Maybe we were being worked and that was the act as opposed to the act being I'm going to put on my air and put the bring the walls down so that way uh, everybody will fear me. And bro, it's funny because here you are, you're sitting here at 16, 17, 18 years later and it sounds to me like you still don't know. No, of course I don't know. Of course I don't know I because... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go no go I was going to say, of course I don't know because I, I, I don't know... I don't know if anybody knows. I don't know if anybody knows. I, I think Vince is so used to working people. He's worked people his entire life. I, who, who the hell knows who he really is? And I don't even know if he knows who he really is. I know there were times when we would be, and this is where I kind of got glimmers of it. There would be times when we would be in his dining room and we'd be having a conversation and he would start telling us a story. A story of when he was growing up, his relationship with his father, growing up in the trailer park, whatever. And I remember these stories were great. And we would just listen to the stories. And, and in my mind, I was like, this is so cool. This is a fascinating story. I'm getting, he's really opening up here and letting us see who he is. And then two weeks later, he'd be being interviewed with Bob Costas. And I would hear the exact same story delivered the exact same way with the exact same emphasis. And I was like, oh, he wasn't opening up. He was warming up. He was practicing. And it was all a presentation. It wasn't who he is. It was who he wanted us to perceive him as. And he was testing the waters on us without letting us know that. Um, so that, that always threw me off. That was like the first time that to me was the same feeling as I had when I was 13 years old, when the first live main event I ever saw in Asbury Park was Larry Zabisco versus, versus Pat Patterson for the IC match, IC title. And then two months later, Larry Zabisco versus Pat Patterson for the IC title. And it was the exact same match, same yeah. finish, same spots and everything. And I was like, oh, okay. So that was the same feeling I had then. I was like, when I would hear Vince tone those stories on Bob Costas, I was like, oh, that wasn't a sincere moment. I gotcha. That was just, he was practicing his sincerity. Yeah. Ed, you and I are different in this aspect and it surprises me a little. Okay. Like, I, I'm like you, Ed. We're both Italian, mm -hmm. but when we're, like, done with somebody, we're done with somebody. With you, it comes a little quicker. Like, it comes a little quicker. Like, you, bro, you were done with Eric Bischoff day one. <laughs> All right? It comes a little quicker with you. Bro, walk me through this, Ed. We never talk about this. We never talk about this, and I want to talk about it now because I, I, I don't remember, and I know you'll remember vividly. Bro, there came a day where you were done with Vince. I'm done. And bro, listen, we were both making good money. It didn't, it wasn't the money. You were done, bro. You 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 were at a point where regardless of what you were making, I'll go make X amount of dollars teaching. It wasn't about the money. You were done. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. So I remember I had to go back to the boss. And long story short, I got I got you more money right. and begged you to stay. And right. you stayed. So he, here's my question, bro. What was that? Like what 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 finally drove you over the edge with this guy that you couldn't work another day? I mean, I, I definitely know what my moment my moment came like boom. Got yeah. it I got it. What was that moment, bro? <sighs> I remember, and I don't remember if this was the moment, but I remember one time when we were at TV and it was when we were, I think it was when we were booking the Undertaker corporate ministry or, or the corporation versus the ministry angle. And I remember we were doing a thing where Stephanie had been kidnapped and you were off doing something with Austin. You were producing Austin and I got to produce Vince. Okay. And we're like, we're, we had these, these backstage vignettes where Vince 
needed to get progressively more upset as the night was going on because Stephanie was missing. Stephanie was gone. She had been kidnapped, and he didn't know if she was alive or dead. God, bro, if he would have known then what he knows now, we would have let it be. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead, bro. Go ahead. go ahead. So I'm trying to get him, I'm trying, A, to get the performance out of him to, to be more upset because Vince is all about never showing weakness and being strong. And just the, that attitude, butting up against that by saying, your daughter has been kidnapped. Mm -hmm. You don't know if she's alive or dead. You'd be more upset. You would be frantic. You would be beside yourself. You would be running your fingers through your hair. You'd, and, and that was, the, that was the, the big thing. I was like, your hair needs to be messed. You look perfect. You look absolutely, he looked like he just stepped out of makeup and wardrobe. And I was like, Vince, you've been here for hours and you, you're, you're, you should be climbing the walls. You should be, your tie should be loose. You should be rumpled. Your hair should be messed up. And he was, and finally, he was like, there, see, happy. He just messed like three hairs. You happy? Is that good? And at that point, that's when you walked into the room and you had just had a good time with Austin. You walked in all smiles. <laughs> Okay, what are we doing? What do we got? What do you got for me? And I was like, he's all yours. And I walked out of the room. <laughs> I said, here, you produce it. I can't get it out of him. You do it. But so it was just that attitude of trying to trying to get across what we wanted to get across. And his his ego was preventing that. His ego was actually hurting the product in that in that instance. But it just got to the point where after a while, just after the grind, it wasn't so much a moment. It was just, it was a gradual buildup. And just the grind of the traveling week in, week out, and traveling with him. Traveling with him. Being at his house at four in the morning, going over the show in the limo all the way to the airport, standing in the galley on the airplane, having a private meeting while everybody's asking us to sit down because he wanted to work, and then working in the car on the way to the arena, and then working at the arena, and then doing the production meeting, then doing the day, and then just that grind, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, just got to the point where I was like, you know what? This is, I'm miserable. I am not happy. I'm not enjoying my life. I'm not, uh, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm burning out. Uh, and it just was not, it was not for me. It was not for me. I am not, I'm not, you know, unlike Vince McMahon, I am not a uh, fiercely competitive person. And I am not a fiercely driven person. I'm all about I'm all about doing what I need to do to make myself happy and to have a good life. I don't need a great life. I just need a good life. And that just got to the point where it just wasn't worth it for me. And that's when I went to you and I said, dude, I'm, I, think, I think this is it. I think this is where I get off because I can't keep this up anymore. I can't do it anymore. Because, and it was mainly, it was mainly the, 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 the demands of being attached to his hip, being on call 24-7, 365. You know, we got to leave at 4 in the morning to, to go on a plane, and he calls us at 10.30 the night before, wanting to go over the show, stuff like that. So it just got to the point where I was like, you know what? Be careful what you wish for because you might get it. And I am just not happy. I, there, was, there were aspects of the job that I loved. I loved working with you. I loved working with the boys. I loved the thrill of the live show. But just the, the, the grind of, of traveling with Vince and being attached to his hip uh, while we were on the road just pushed me over the edge, and I just couldn't handle it. God, bro, I was, I was just going to ask you something when you were going on along that. But you should have interrupted me, you, you no, see, no, you old I, bastard. I told you, I forgot. I was just thinking you were saying it. I was thinking I was going to ask you something. All right, bro. Um, you want me to do bro, a dance? You, you know what's funny? Maybe it'll come to me when I tell you this story. But okay. you know what's funny? We we know you and I know you tell people Vince is twenty four. I just remember what I have to ask you. You just okay. remember Vince is twenty four seven. You know we know when you tell people Vince is twenty four seven wrestling, they don't understand, bro. Bro, you know like how I know like, and that's the thing, bro. We were not twenty seven four wrestling. You and I were not. We're not, no. bro. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we did. 
we did make sacrifices. We did put WW. We did put him and his company on the on on the front burner. And a lot of times, bro, we did put our family second because we were at his beck and call. But we weren't wrestling twenty four seven. We weren't those guys. We weren't marks for the business. We weren't those guys, bro. Right. I swear to this day, I can remember the movie that Vince told me he went to see with Linda, the title of the ridiculous movie, because I was like, wait a minute, you went to the movies with Linda? You and Linda went to the movies, and then to this day, I remember the name of that freaking movie. Is it There's Something About Mary? No. Oh, it okay, was that, I remember that the, the worst movie in the world with Richard, Dre Richard Dreyfus when he was like with that tribe, the Kiplings, or you know, oh you my know god, I'm Kiplingers tribe yes, or something. Yes, that, yes. oh, <laughs> and I'll never forget that because I'm like, bro, I couldn't believe this. Here's what I wanted to ask you, okay, Ed. As years went by after we left. And WCW and this as years went by, Ed. I always I, I don't I always offered gratitude towards Vince. And what I mean by that, bro, was like when it was a holiday. I would send Vince an email. How you doing, bro? Thinking of you. Hope everything is good. Blah, 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 blah. Bro was never looking for a job or nothing like that. It was like I got on a mission, bro. I, I almost got to the point on a mission where I'm going to have some communication with this jackass, whether he likes it or not. That that That's what it got for me because, bro, I would send these emails, and you know what I would get in response? THX. And I would and I would be like F you THX bro and I'd send another one and could get nothing out of them. Nothing, bro. Nothing, 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 nothing. Okay. Now, and I have to ask you something. I see these wrestlers come back after they've sued them, they've buried them, they've done everything you could imagine to Vince McMahon in their back, and they're talking and they're going in the Hall of Fame, and yada, 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 yada. What was it that the day we left his two writers that literally brought him from the red to the black, regardless of what anybody wants to say about him being the great filter? Well, who, who, who's the filter today? That's what I want to know. Yeah, but, exactly. the, but the question is, why, why were we dead to him? When we left, why couldn't there even be a cordial? Yeah, bro, we worked closely together for five years. Whatever you, you know. Now, now we're doing different things. We can have a conversation. Like I, I just, I could never freaking. Uh, why were we dead to him? I'll why you, are we dead to him? I, I'll tell you exactly why. These wrestlers that keep coming back after they've sued him, after they've been fired under terrible circumstances, this, that, and the other thing, if they've been blackballed, they come back because Vince McMahon himself never said, I, you know, I am I I am the world wrestling entertainment champion, or I packed Madison Square Garden, or I did the matches. But with us. What we did is something that he is actively given credit for, given all the credit for. He's not given the credit for what Hogan did, so he can bring Hogan back because that's no, uh, that's no, uh, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't cut against what he has to offer and what he has done because Vince did his thing, Hogan did his thing, so he can bring Hogan and he could, it could be a magnanimous gesture. But by bringing us back or or even acknowledging us, it basically says, oh, this isn't Vince's genius. This isn't all because of Vince McMahon, and uh, you know our very existence kind of kind of lessens uh, 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 the the total creative output that he claims on the times that we were there. So that's the reason why we're not there because us, we have, we, to, to acknowledge us would be to acknowledge that it wasn't all him. Okay. Well, but Ed, is, is that an, e let me ask you this. Is that an ego thing or cause I, I always used to think like Vince wanted everybody to believe he was Walt Disney. 
Mm -hmm. Everything, I'm Disney. Everything comes from me. There's, there's nobody doing it. He had this Walt <laughs> Disney syndrome. So, like, Ed, what, what is what you're talking about? Is that ego or is it the persona that he wants everybody to see? No, this is all me. I did all this. What, what, what is it? I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's both because I think that it is the persona because that is, you know, you can't acknowledge, he can't acknowledge the con the contribution that we made. It was kind of like what we, what we heard about, you know, the, the, when, when T Taylor would tell us about what that day was, what that day was like at TV, that was the first day that we weren't there when they were at the Meadowlands mm -hmm. and we had just quit the day before um, about how, you know, he absolutely no sold it, which he had to do. He had to no sell it because, you know, there, there, there was all of a sudden there was something that everybody who's backstage knew what a big part we played in it. They might not have known everything that we did or been aware of every aspect of, of our positions, but they knew what a big part we were because they knew who was producing all the backstage stuff. They knew who was the one that was coming up with the things when things had to change. They knew who was working on the show and who was actually writing the shows. So for us to not be there all of a sudden, he had to know sell that because he had to be a leader and put out a brave front that we are fine. You know what? Let them go. That's fine. We will be fine because we've still got me. And that to me is, is where that, that came from. Um, I forget what the hell your question was though. I do this all the time in class. Do you remember what your what question was? My was? Question, bro? I don't know. We're why we, we're why, 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 my, my question was why, why we, why he would never even have oh. a relationship with us after we left. Yeah. Because I think that, I think that acknowledging us and this is ego acknowledging us basically he would look at as, as it would be taking away from him taking away from his image taking away from his legend yeah. as it were yeah, and uh, i i think bro in a lot of ways i think in a lot of ways it was he himself who who painted and built this filter facade I, I, I really think, that, I mean, things that I've heard him say and things that I've seen, I think he created that. And because Vince McMahon said it, oh, everybody believes it. Whereas, you know, well, no. And it maybe if the two guys were there, the two guys would speak up and say, no, that's not really what happened. Well, again, you know, it goes back to the history books are written, written by the winners. And so he gets, he gets to, to, he gets to, to, to set that narrative, but he was doing that before we even left. Remember cigar aficionado, Yeah. you know, he was doing it before we even left when they, they you know, they had that interview in cigar aficionado and, you know, they asked about the create, they asked him about the creative. He didn't even mention us. He, he said it was all him and Shane that would come up with everything. And that was one of the turning points for us. Cause yeah. I remember we went to, we, we had gone over to the mall for lunch do a little Dawn of the Dead action. Yeah. Watch, watch the senior citizens shuffle around the mall like Dawn of the Dead. And then we 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 went in the bookstore and we saw him on the cover of Cigar Aficionado. And the two of us are sitting there reading. And at the same moment, the two of us looked up at each other and went, that son of a bitch. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're busting our asses like a couple of jamokes at your house, killing ourselves to come up with the TV that him and Shane were writing. Yeah. We didn't yeah. even know. We had no idea Shane, what Shane and him were writing that show. All right, and here's here's what I cannot fathom. Like this is what I cannot fathom. Like, bro, people can say whatever they freaking want to say. He's still driving a bus. He's still the guy in charge. Everything goes through him. He's doing creative on SmackDown and Raw. The whole nine yards. He's doing it all. Okay, bro. I mean, bro, the fact that he's seventy something and it, bro, he was out of touch to begin with. The fact that he's 70 now, he's way, way out of touch. He's so bro. Any anybody can look at television today and see like just how far behind the times the WWE. It's just it's ridiculous, bro. Everything has advanced in television, you know, from reality shows to you know, uh, you know, freaking uh 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 um, Beretta versus CSI. I mean, we've, <laughs> we've seen a transition. Into, not wrestling, bro. After the Attitude Era, wrestling went in reverse. That's all thanks to Vince McMahon, who doesn't watch TV, who doesn't go to the movies, who has no idea what's going on in the pop culture world. He's in a he, bubble. He's in a bubble. He has destroyed that product because 
as the years go on and nothing changes, it becomes more and more and more of the laughing stock to the point that now guys have to do death defying moves to try to convince people that it's real. I, bro, I can't fathom ego or no ego, Ed. I can't fathom that he's still sitting in that office doing this, especially when you consider his age, the money he has. He has a Shane. He has a Stephanie. I, Bro, that if, if that right there really doesn't give us the answer that he is ego driven. What what would be the reason for him to continue to stay in the role that he's in? What what would possibly be the reason that he's that he's physically stuck in the chair? Other than that, it's ego. It's 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 what you said. It is ego because it is not wanting to step away. Because the thing is, if he steps away, and the product gets better, then that blows a hole in who he is and was and the effect that he's had on the business. So he can't afford to based on his ego because he is ego driven. And and there's absolutely no doubt in my mind there never was about how ego driven he is. I mean we look at, you look at some of the major flubs that he has done over the years and they all are ego and hubris. The XFL, I'm going to I'm going to take on the the NFL flop WBF flop um uh, 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 um there was something else I was thinking of uh, um um blank as a fart but anyway but his 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 ego oh the big one and this is to me one of the most telling things about him is you go back to that steroid trial which is back before he was sitting on top of the world back before he was you know you know a billionaire um you go back to that and anybody who got through that and and weren't ego driven would have said wow I dodged a bullet and, there. And, and keep your mouth shut. Yes, I dodged a bullet. But what did he do? What was his attitude? I beat the feds. Screw them. They tried to take me down. I took them down. Yeah. You know, and that's that's who we're talking about. He's all about ego and pumping himself up because, you know, he comes from, you know, I think he comes from a background where he was struggling and scrapping for everything he got as a kid. But who the hell knows? Who knows? That could all be a constructed narrative because this is wrestling. The whole business is based on a lie. So why shouldn't he embellish who he is and who he has been and where he came from? What you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, as Conan always says. But that's that's that is who he is, and he can use that to pump up his own ego, and then that feeds his ego, and then he needs that ego to be fed even more. And it's just this vicious cycle. So that that's why we get to the point now where nothing has changed, it's all stayed the same. But the one thing that the you know, the the reason that you can point to is the fact that he he hasn't stepped down. He hasn't taken a backseat. He hasn't let anybody else take the reins because the minute he lets somebody else take the reins and it doesn't fail, he feels like a failure. That doesn't help his ego. And if he and if he gives the reins to somebody else and they do fail, well, he doesn't want this thing that he created to fail. So he's going to he's going to hold on to that, I think, as long as he possibly can. As long as he possibly can. It's part of that ego, though, bro. It's part of that ego, like, looking at his own kids and looking at his son-in-law, you know, looking at, you know, the, 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 the next in charge. And, you know, basically, like, they can never do the job I can. I mean, is 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 that part of the ego as well? Or do you think he, 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 he even believes that they're capable? Will his ego allow him to believe they're capable of filling his shoes. Maybe, but he would never, again, it's it's all about how he presents to other people. So even if he does believe that, he would never indicate that. He would never, he would never give that up. You know what I mean? He would never, uh, 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 he would never give, give outwardly, um, get, let that come across. He would always keep that wall up. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, another thing that I was trying to think of before. You think of the WCW invasion angle that they did. 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He he owned WCW at this point, and he's and he's trying to set up an angle, and he still could not bring himself to allow WCW's guys to get any real heat on the WWF guys yeah. because that you know I, I I'll, I'll never forget watching the show when you had at the end of the show uh you know the announcers going crazy there's a big brawl in the ring and the announcers are going crazy oh my god this is the biggest threat that the WWE has ever faced will we ever survive and meanwhile the announcers are saying that but in the ring what i'm seeing is three wwe guys kicking the shit out of about a dozen and a half wcw guys and making the wcw guys look like clump uh, clowns and chumps so that to me he couldn't even allow himself to let them get a little heat on his guys not even win this is just the build-up they couldn't even get any heat because that would have been an admission of weakness on his part, an admission that, oh, these guys were able to get the, 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 the drop on my guys. He couldn't even do that, and he owned them. So that, to me, is, is, a, is a big testament to the, the, the level of ego that we're talking about. And is that good for the product? Absolutely not. Is it good for him? Absolutely. I mean, here, we've been talking about him for almost an hour. Uh, uh, you know, he's a fascinating individual. He's a fascinating person. He's somebody who is mysterious. People don't know who he really is. You know, we worked with him for years. We don't even know who the hell he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. But and, and I mean, were you there that last day at WCW with you? Oh yeah. oh yeah, Panama City. Yeah, you had a cross pass with Shane McMahon, right? Yep. Tell cross- me, I never, I never heard that story. I walked up to him. I, I shook his hand. I said, congratulations. Uh, um, wish you the best. And that was it. That was pretty much it. Uh, um, because of the fact that, you know, I was backstage. I didn't have anything to do that day because they had their producers running everything. You know, they had, they had, they had, uh, I think, I think Jerry was there, Jerry Briscoe and Bruce was there and they had some other people, they had some production people. Um, but they were running the show. So all I, I was just, I was a lame duck. I was just there sitting there backstage at the, at the show doing if they needed anything, but I don't even remember what I did that night. And they, it was uh, weird. And after that, like an, a, an yeah. olive branch was never extended. Well, actually after that, I've told this story before, but I don't think I've told it. Bro, you on, can't with say you. that on this show. We got to, okay. I've never like, told this story. Like, yeah. but, okay. This is exclusive. Oh. This is the first time I've ever told this. Here we go. Uh, I'll start by saying that Vince McMahon's a terrible kisser. Um, okay. Right. But that has nothing to do with anything. I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, after WCW uh, went away, I knew that you know my deal was different than yours. Uh, my contract was different than yours, and I knew that my contract was assumable. They could have assumed my contract and 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 basically forced me to report to work. Um, I was talking with uh, Diana Myers, who was the head legal counsel of WCW, and uh, she had told me what was going on. And I said, okay, I said, do me a favor, because she was in the process of doing lots of meetings with them to talk about contracts and what people were going, what people were going where and what they were doing. And I said to her, look, if it comes up in the meeting, um, if do if you, if you, like me at all. And I had a good relationship with her. I said, please uh, do me a favor and tell them I've been an absolute pain in the ass to work with. Tell them I've been terrible. What have you do what you have to do, but I do not want them to assume my contract. I would much rather, I said, if I wanted to work for WWF, I would still be with them. Mm -hmm. Um, So I said, please, if, if there's anything you can do to get me out of that, I would really appreciate it. Um, And she said, okay, if it comes up, I will. I think you're being silly. I don't think it's going to come to that, but okay. About a week later, I heard from her and she said, wow, you were right. They wanted you. They wanted to bring you on. And I said, absolutely. I know they wanted to bring me on because they would want to station me in WWF Siberia. They would want to bring me on and put a broom in my hand and say, get yeah. sweeping, yeah, little boy. You would have been the first in life at a Kiss Vince's ass club. Yeah, exactly. And that's because I know how they operate. Like I, the way I always say it when people say, oh, you worked in wrestling. How was that? And I was like, well, it was half like joining the circus and half like being in the mob. Yeah. So I knew what I knew what it was. And I said, 
I, I saw that coming and I was like, this is their opportunity to punish both of us through me for daring to defect to the enemy like we did. Right. Um, so she said, yeah, they wanted you. But she was able to negotiate it so that way they didn't assume my contract and I couldn't have been happier. Well, I'm surprised they didn't make you go over there, bro. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she, I, I don't know if Diana was able to, to talk them out of it or what, but however it worked out, it worked out. So I, I was very happy because I, I had no desire to go back there, especially after you and I had defected to the enemy because I knew that there would be punishment involved. Yeah, yeah. All right, and listen, I know you got to go, bro, and I didn't want to keep you over time, but listen, man, great discussion, and I'm glad we talked about something other than the freaking state of wrestling today. I'm just, I'm so sick and tired of talking about it. That's why I wanted to, you know, talk about this subject, but... um. But thanks, bro. I mean, you oh, gotta go. So you gotta tell Terry Hunter, tell them all I said hi <laughs> over there. Norman, I think Norman's over there still. Norman's right, there. Bro? Norman's there. And you know, we're working on we're, we're working on the next big takeover show. We're getting that going. You know, we really shouldn't talk about this because people are gonna think that somebody's gonna tune in. They're gonna think this is a shoot. They're not gonna realize that this is a bro, joke. Bro, whatever happened. For... Last question: Whatever yeah. happened to the zombies versus the vampires, bro? Uh, what happened? What Come happened was on, I started man. working. I started bro, working. I bro. got. I, I think. I think that was the big one for you, bro. <laughs> I think that was the big one, bro. I think if I had finished it like four years ago, when I when I had written most of it, it could have been. But I think now that's that's played out. It's so old now. The stuff that I had yeah, written then bro, has been that done. That was all before the Walking Dead nonsense. Yeah. Bro. That was all before that. I know. I know. I know. I just, uh, you know what? I When I get done at the end of my day and at the end of my week, I am so burnt out yeah, creatively because that's because what I'm doing is I'm working with students who are writing scripts and I am constantly, my creative juices are going to help them and yeah, make their scripts better. Yeah. So, and that's, that's okay. That's okay. Because again, you know, now, hey, now you're not the only one in his 50s anymore. Now I, I just know, joined you. Bro, I just I joined you. you. 50, I just bro, joined you. I'm in a 5 0 club. Look, let me show you what just came in the mail. You see that? Oh, there you go, just bro. Just came in the mail. There you, you go. Know, I'm two, two weeks I'm, before my birthday. I'm too cheap to pay the dues on that gimmick, bro. Oh, but doesn't it pay for itself? Isn't yeah, it, it does. It, it, itself? it does, but I still. 16 still, bucks? You're too cheap I'm for 16 cheap bucks. For 16 large. Hey, Ed, what is the one? Give me two. One last question. One last right. question. Okay. Uh, what is the go to TV show right now for you? <sighs> right now, I, I've, I've got to say Walking Dead because I'm so I'm still so invested in it and I have to watch a bunch of shows for my class for my students and some of their shows are shows that I would not necessarily be watching and that kind of takes up my time but Walking Dead I think is phenomenal I watched the first episode of Atlanta uh, which I am dying to watch the rest of them I'm trying to get Franny to watch the first episode with me because if she wants to watch the series we'll watch the whole thing um, Everything that Marvel's doing on Netflix, I think, is outstanding television. Um, that's what I'm watching right now, though. I'm watching what, Walking Dead. What movie do we have to all go see, according to Ed Ferrara? According, okay. Right now, I mean, you know I'm a Marvel geek. Doctor Strange, that, that I thought was phenomenal. Movie that just came out, and I was talking about this the other day. Uh, a movie that just came out on video not too long ago. There were two movies that I really enjoyed. Did you see The Nice Guys? No. The nice Guys. It's it's a buddy cop comedy with uh, uh, Russell Crowe and um, uh, Ryan Gosling. And it's set in the 1970s. And it is... I know it's, you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It yeah. was so good. The wow, script was so really? good. Huh? It was funny as hell. Oh, funny man. as hell but also a really good story good good mystery good thriller um but it's one of those movies that kind of slipped by and a lot of people didn't see i watched it on video and i was like oh my god this is this is the best movie i'd seen in a long time really so that, yeah okay. oh it was okay. so I'm much gonna, i mean watch that this weekend yeah not a life-changing movie but just a really solid funny well-written uh 
re- exciting thriller action cop comedy. Nice, uh, nice. Um, and the two of them had such good chemistry together. It's good stuff. That was really good. And I thought Keanu with Key and Peele was hysterical. Yeah. Hey, and you know, we never talked about one last question because we covered TV. We, we covered the movies. What you, you and I, I don't think we have ever freaking had a conversation about music. music. What's your go to music, bro? When you need to like the music of your choice when I just need to chill out. When I need to chill, it depends. Um, I'm, I'm, I love uh, everything that Jeff Lynn has ever done, which is Electric Light Orchestra. Uh, 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 you know, going back, going back to the you know seventies really? and eighties. Oh, I, I mean, know that about well, you as a Beatles yeah. freak. Oh yeah, no, I know that. I, and that's what's funny, bro. I hate ELO. Oh but really? I, I, and I know there was such a Beatle info. I did not yep. know that. I right, go ahead. Yep. Who else? Uh, that um last Mel Torme, year, Mel Torme, Mel Torme, Mel Torme, uh, uh, Bobby Vinton, Bobby Vinton, yeah. huge. <laughs> uh, uh, Kings of Leon, their new album I thought was great. Just got that. Um, uh, Squeeze is one of my favorite groups from the eighties. Breakfast, uh, in, bro, was it coffee? Black coffee in bed. I Black love one of my favorite bed. songs, bro. Yeah. They came out with a new album last year that was like every song on it was was oh, catchy wow. and okay. really good. Um, but I've been listening a lot just recently. I just started listening to, uh, you want to talk about broad, uh, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of childish Gambino, mm-hmm. uh, who's a, uh, it's a, a, a rap R and B oh. hip hop. Oh. Uh, this guy, have you ever watched, you ever watch, um, community? No, I know community, but I don't watch it. That's not my, All right, you know, who, you know who Donald Glover is? Yes. The, yes. the African-American guy. He, he is childish Gambino. So he he that's like his rap persona. Lethal but. Weapon. <laughs> what is he? Is he in Lethal Weapon? The movie, the TV series, rather. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no the, t- the movie. The movie. That's Danny. Childish that's Gambino. Danny Glover. Danny, Danny Glover. Glover. Oh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Oh, Gambino. You know, Gambino. All right, what? Right. All right. Okay. But that his new album just came out, and it's I just hate rap. I phenomenal. Hate rap. I hate rap. Well, you don't I, have to. You don't have to like it. Yeah, I hate. It. All right, listen. I gotta let All you right. go, bro. I even saved my uh, my uh, commercials to the end, so I could let you go. I'll kill you, Mike. Go do what you gotta do. Awesome. And thanks, bro. I'll see you soon, bro. Love you, kid. Let's talk you. again soon. We will right. take you. Thanks, man. Later, bro. All right. Bye. There you go, everybody. The great Ed Ferrara, of course, my good friend and one of my favorite guests and the smartest person that I know. And obviously, he dropped a couple of words in that interview that I didn't know what he was talking about. And he purposely does that. But let me tell you, that interview was brought to you by True Car. When you're looking to buy a car, you want to make sure that you're getting real pricing on actual inventory, not the bait on and switch. Because unfortunately, a lot of times this isn't the case. People can figure cars online only later to find out they're not available. With TrueCar, you can get pricing on actual inventory. And this is not pricing offered by TrueCar, but pricing from an actual dealer. And not just any dealer, but a TrueCar certified dealer. Using TrueCar will also help you find the car that you want easily, hassle free. TrueCar will also show you what other people are paying for the same car that you're interested in. So they'll help you find the car easily. They'll let you know what the right pricing is on that car. There are over 3 million cars that have been sold to TrueCar users by the TrueCar certified dealers nationwide. And there are over 13,000 True Car certified dealers nationwide. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Some features are not available in all states. I want to tell you now, too, with the holidays coming, how you can support our show. Um, here's what you got to do. If you buy on Amazon, all you have to do is go to my Amazon banner on podcastone.com uh, when you buy stuff through Amazon. A small amount of the purchase goes directly to help support this podcast at no extra cost. Here's exactly how you do it. Go to Podcast One, 
click on Kill It Deals link, click my show logo, Vince Russo, the brand, and you'll see Amazon and all my sponsors. Then when you click the link, bookmark it so it's easy to use the next time. It's a cool way where you can help us keep doing this podcast, not each and every week, each and every day. So please support us through Amazon, Killer Deals, Podcast One, the link, and also Go to podcastone.com forward slash the brand and subscribe to this show and they will send you an email when every new show drops and a synopsis of that show. Again, that's a free service to you. Just go to podcastone.com forward slash the brand and subscribe. Also remember for the month of December on the Realm Network, R-E-L-M Network, you can get all of the shows that you listen to on Podcast One a day earlier for free on video. For the whole month of December, that's free. After that, it's only $2.95 a month. We also put up exclusive content that you don't get anywhere else. So go sign up at therealmnetwork.com, R-E-L-M network.com, or russosbrand.com. Also, if you don't follow me on Twitter, please do at the Vince Russo. Well, thanks for joining me today, everybody. I will see you right back here tomorrow. Same bad time, same bad channel. Take care, everybody. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Add another swerve and then put it on a pole again. Put it on a pole again. Put it on the pole again. And I swear to God, it's gonna get emotional as I wait to over.